our speakers uh, first to Dr. Schrott. Um, and Dr. Schrott is the co-lead for Healthy Smile, Happy Child, and he's a professor and clinician scientist in the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. He currently holds a Canadian Institute of Health Research Embedded Clinician Researcher position with a salary award from the CIHR uh, for improving access to oral health care and oral health care delivery for at-risk young children in Manitoba. He also, um, his research focuses on early childhood oral health and the epidemiology of early childhood caries in at-risk populations. I also want to introduce you to uh, Melina Sturm. Melina graduated from the University of Manitoba in the School of Dental Hygiene in 2017, and she is currently working as a research assistant and oral health promoter with Healthy Smile, Happy Child. And she also does uh, clinical work at Mount Carmel Clinic here in Winnipeg. Uh, so um, we'll begin now. So perfect. So, sorry, just for one second. Okay, so thanks everybody. Sorry for that technical glitch just there, um, running off of multiple laptops as we're trying to social distance as we do a co-presentation. Um, so I do want to start off with, so we're going to ask questions and then we'll talk if something is a myth or a fact. So our first question, and a lot of these questions are things that do come up in our day-to-day -day routines when we are working and promoting oral health in the community. And so many times we do ask our community contacts to send in questions to us or we get asked at community gatherings. So the first one here is smoking during pregnancy will have no effect on my baby's oral health. And we'd like to say that that's a myth. Um, there is increasing evidence now to suggest that there are connections between smoking during pregnancy and um, early childhood oral health, specifically tooth decay or early childhood caries in the infant and preschool population. So there have been studies saying that smoking during pregnancy is actually associated with a higher um, likelihood of children going for dental surgery under GA, and that's a study that we just published in the fall in the journal Pediatric Dentistry. Uh, but as we look through, there's many articles that are starting to emerge now showing that there is actually an association between smoking by moms or uh, smoke during pregnancy or even smoking within the home environment um, during the uh, prenatal and early childhood period. Um, but unfortunately, we're not always quite sure as the exact mechanism, but the evidence is growing to, to show that um, smoking in the household um, from an early age and even before birth can increase a child's risk of caries even uh, after controlling for other confounding factors. So here's from our study um, in pediatric dentistry um, that did look at a host of early childhood, prenatal and maternal characteristics that were associated with children undergoing pediatric dental surgery in Manitoba. And the cohort included over 16,000 children who actually underwent dental surgery over a six year period of time in Winnipeg and, and rest of Manitoba. And controls were children who did not undergo a pediatric dental surgery um, so um, we did find here that uh, there was an association and in fact 64% of moms uh, in the study uh, of, were reporting um, that they were uh, smoking uh, during pregnancy. So that's actually quite a startling statistic um, when we're actually thinking that a lot of uh, times most women are trying to avoid uh, smoking during pregnancy. So the next topic is uh, pregnancy will not affect a woman's oral health. Um, this is also a myth. So um, when women get pregnant, there's a lot of uh, physiological changes that they go through, including a surge in hormones, which can affect their oral health. Um, 
we know uh, that oral health is key to overall health and well-being. So we have to make sure that when we see patients who are pregnant, um, we have to uh, let them know about this risk and let them know that they need to keep up with their oral health, establish a good oral health routine in order to um, maintain that and their overall um, well-being. So due to um, changes in hormone levels, uh, pregnant women are more likely to develop gum disease. This is referred to as uh, pregnancy gingivitis. Um, gingivitis that can then uh, progress to periodontal disease if there's no good oral health routine established. And um, so this means that they can be, there can be some uh, bone loss in their mouth. So if we don't do anything about it uh, at the beginning, gum disease is preventable and it can be reversed. But once it progresses to periodontal disease, um, there's not much that we can do in terms of pre prevention, just um, making sure that it doesn't get worse. So just starting at the very beginning, um, it's a good way to start giving uh, pregnant women tips on how to establish a good oral health routine. Um, and there's also research that shows that um, there's a link between um, gingivitis or periodontal disease during pregnancy and underweight preterm babies. So uh, that's an important thing to also let them know so that they, they can start taking good care of their uh, mouth at an early stage. Um, the next topic is I don't need to worry about my baby's oral health while well, they don't have any teeth. That's also a myth. Um, we know that dental care should start before uh, the eruption of teeth. Um, it's important that we start wiping um, the baby's gums um, before, before they have any teeth, just making sure that we take a wet, clean cloth after feeding to remove uh, sugars that stay in the mouth. Um, ideally, this should be done after every meal, but if, it, if it's not possible, we always say try at least at night before bedtime. Um, so doing this can reduce the risk of baby teeth um, developing caries um, soon after the eruption of the teeth. And it also gets, I always tell the moms I talk to, it also gets the baby used to going, uh, used to having someone in their mouth just uh, poking around or uh, wiping their mouth from an early stage so that they are not um, uncomfortable once you introduce brushing once they have teeth. Thanks, Melina. So another question that comes up quite often and is, is with respect to breastfeeding and does that increase the risk for caries? Um, so in general, we're going to say that this is a myth, um, but we will talk in a few moments about uh, some aspects of breastfeeding that might be associated with increased risk for caries in young children. So generally speaking, breastfeeding is protective and is in most epidemiological surveys associated with a lower risk of children developing early childhood caries. We know that breast is best um, and we do want to make sure um, that's a healthy part of uh, childhood development and a natural way for women to feed their babies. Um, we don't actually recommend um, a time to wean from breastfeeding. Um, quite interesting, when we've surveyed dentists over the years in Manitoba, um, many years ago before there was a lot of emphasis on early childhood oral health and the first infant visit, um, a lot of dentists were actually recommending um, when asked um, that uh, breastfeeding actually children be weaned before at a younger age than children um, when they would say should be weaned from a bottle. So we know that there's still a lot of um, thought out there um, that when people will hear the term, the old term nursing caries, um, that people associate caries with breastfeeding, but we want to know, or we want people to know that breast is, is healthy, um, just to make sure that if you are breastfeeding your child, that you're supplementing appropriately with vitamin D uh, in consultation with your uh, healthcare provider to ensure that babies are obtaining sort of the Canadian Pediatric Society recommended um, intake uh, for vitamin D. Um, however, there are questions that do emerge and this is always a growing field of, of interest and research. And so there has been a recent systematic review that's come forward by Paula Monahan uh, and colleagues where they actually looked at several questions. Um, question one was, 
Does breastfeeding beyond one year of age increase the risk of early childhood caries as compared with breastfeeding until less than one year of age? And they found 21 studies that looked at this difference. Of these, one was a case control study and 19 were cross-sectional. And the highest level of evidence was from this cohort study that followed children over time. And they really showed no significant difference in severity at five years of age between children breastfed up to 23 months and those only breastfed for one year. However, um, there are now um, studies that have looked beyond sort of that um, one year of breastfeeding. And so question two in the systematic review was, does breastfeeding beyond one year of age increase the risk of ECC uh, compared with cow milk? And they didn't find any studies there, but I think the most intriguing question is, does breastfeeding beyond two years of age increase the risk of a child getting caries compared to breastfeeding less than two years of age? And so they did look here and eight studies provided data that allowed them to look at this. Um, one was case control, uh, five were cross-sectional studies, and um, the highest level, of course, was from the study that not only uh, that followed kids over a period of time. And they showed that breastfeeding beyond two years of age did increase the risk for caries, showing that there is, a, there is an effect. And so this is where we do want to let uh, breastfeeding moms know and families know that should they choose to breastfeed their child before uh, or beyond um, two years of age, oral hygiene and good regular dental care is really important. Um, as I mentioned, our, our recent study that looked and our last uh, Zoom presentation that looked at evidence relating to um, prenatal early childhood uh, and maternal characteristics that were associated with kids undergoing dental surgery for early childhood caries. Uh, we found that uh, moms who initiated breastfeeding in hospital their children were less likely to undergo pediatric dental surgery for caries than uh, moms um, who uh, did um, initiate breastfeeding in hospital. So showing that there is some evidence here with even in a Manitoba context that breastfeeding offers protection um, at least at the early age um, soon after birth. We'll go to the next slide, Molina. So this is a paper that came out of the Target Kids collaboration. So it's a group of pediatricians and family um, uh, doctors in Toronto, um, where they've used their clinical data and pooled it together to look at multiple health issues in children and assess risk factors for certain conditions. And so here in this study, they looked at a total breastfeeding duration and dental caries in this uh, generally healthy urban population. And I'll note that this population tends to be of a higher socioeconomic um, uh, index than uh, some other populations that we typically associate with early childhood caries. So as you can see graphed on the right um, is sort of the confidence intervals in pink and sort of here predicting the probability of dental caries up on um, the um, vertical axis and the horizontal axis is the total duration of breastfeeding in months, where it's showing that over time, um, once you reach certain ages of breastfeeding, um, then the risk for caries will begin to increase for children. If I could just ask if people mute themselves, thank you. Alina, next slide. So within the same paper, um, they were able to look at, so near the top, um, we have the variable of total breastfeeding duration. So they grouped kids into four different categories of less than six months, six months to 11 months, 12 months to just under 24 months or 24 months and beyond. And so the reference group here, they compared everything against the, the youngest group um, who are only breastfed for short duration of time for just under a six-month period of time. And here showing both the unadjusted. So unadjusted is they looked at just the relationship between caries and the variable of breastfeeding duration um, and found that children who were breastfed for 24 months or greater um, had um, 2.75 times more odds of developing caries than those who were breastfed for a shorter duration. 
And then after controlling for many of these other factors, including sex of the child, a high school education of the parent, um, single parent status, socioeconomic factors, um, they did also conclude that beyond the 24 month period of time increases the risk um, for caries by 2.75 times. So again, I think just to re-emphasize that it's really important um, to make sure that oral hygiene is maintained and, and breastfed children have good oral hygiene routines established in the home. And that's our job as dental providers to help uh, inform and pass that information on. So just, Melina, the last slide on this section, because there will be questions about, well, is it breastfeeding directly that's contributing to caries? And so if we look here on this, on the left of the screen, this article by Paris and colleagues, also some of the same folks that did the other study recently, um, they did um, draw sort of an illustration of the different pathways in which um, um, breastfeeding may be connected with increased caries. So there's definitely socioeconomic aspects um, that inter sort of influence multi different segments. So if we look at the sort of that top arch um, from breastfeeding to dental caries, there could be a direct connection. If we look at the bottle uh, or the bottom sort of arch and series of arrows, breastfeeding then combined with bottle feeding sort of the two combined might also be contributing, so infant feeding practices. And then the other third sort of pathway that's being considered is breastfeeding, but also then adding sugars into the child's diet. Um, is, is that then sort of the vehicle with which breastfeeding is getting lumped into causing caries? So I think in general, their recommendations for patients and policymakers is they did say that breastfeeding duration um, of more than 12 months, 18 months, uh, or 24 months does is somewhat associated with an increased risk for caries. Um, and so we just need to make sure that parents are aware and are using fluoridated toothpaste, are sort of cleaning and brushing teeth after feeding episodes. Um, so we, we don't want to discourage this practice of breastfeeding, but we also want to know that after certain periods of time, once the dentition is erupting, um, there is a chance um, for caries to occur. Okay, and Melina, I'll let you talk about, or do you want me to talk about this resource too? Um, or you're going to speak to uh, Yeah, no, this is just a resource that uh, we wanted to share um, about breastfeeding. So um, how, how to keep your baby teeth healthy while breastfeeding and the reasons why it's good for the baby as well if you choose to breastfeed. Um, you can find this resource and all our other resources uh, on our website. If you Google, um, our, uh, yeah, if you Google Healthy Smile, Happy Child, it should take you there. So they're all available uh, to print um, if you want. So the PDF and uh, a lot of our resources are also um, in French and other languages as well. But I just wanted to show you this one that we have if you if you need something about breastfeeding. And again, done in response to requests from um, public health folks mm -hmm. and parents as well, wanting information um, that they could share with uh, families. Yeah. Well, the next one, this one I get asked a lot when I go out uh, to parenting groups, for, for example. Um, so uh, teething will cause my baby to develop a high fever. So this is also a myth. Um, so a lot of parents are concerned when their children start teething because they can see a lot of different symptoms occurring during this time. Um, and a lot of parents are especially worried about the um, fever, uh, babies developing like a high fever during teething. Um, so a high fever is not usually a normal symptom for teething, but there's other things that do appear during this period that um, it's more normal for uh, parents to see. So uh, a lot of um, these include fussiness, trouble sleeping, irritabil irritability, uh, loss of appetite, drooling more than usual, a facial rash also probably due to the uh, drooling, increased biting, and sometimes a mild temperature elevation. But um, I always say if your baby does develop a very high fever, uh, that is probably not because of teething and should be taken to a doctor. Um, but yeah, high fever, not usually a normal symptom of uh, teething. 
I have here some tips that we usually give to parents um, for when they, their babies start teething. So how to soothe it a uh, teething baby, we usually, the, the thing that we recommend the most is just giving your child a clean, wet, cool cloth to suck on. So it's just a uh, clean cloth, wet, put it in the fridge for a, a few minutes, and then that usually helps to the baby. Um, just gently rubbing their gums with a clean finger or a moist uh, cloth, or even just a, a cold um, spoon that helps just softly um, pressing on their gums. Um, giving your child a cold teething ring as well, just looking for ones that are made of solid rubber, no uh, liquid inside, and also just making sure that you uh, check where they're made and if they have any um, dangerous materials like lead paints, that's something to look out for. Um, things to avoid, as I said, the liquid filled teething rings because they could break through that. Um, plastic objects that could break um, and that could become a choking hazard. Uh, teething biscuits, we usually um, recommend staying away from those because they're usually full of sugar and um, that can lead to caries. Amber necklaces are something that we get asked a lot. Um, we don't usually recommend them because they could be a choking hazard, so we just tell them to stick maybe to something like the uh, cold cloth. And then numbing gels um, that are sold over the counter. Um, these can be dangerous. Um, they could cause uh, cause some uh, local reactions. And if they are um, given a lot of that, they could also um, cause seizures uh, in some cases. There's some studies done on that. Melina, one of the things as well, um, so a lot of this is sourced from the American Academy of Pediatrics, so from pediatricians. And I noticed because I gave a lecture to a physician assistant this morning and had a, had a similar slide and mm -hmm. Their resource was actually recommending frozen bananas, but I oh. also I worry about that if a child is left unattended and should bite through a frozen banana piece, you know that yeah. is a chance for choking, right? Yeah. So, yeah. but it was intriguing that they yeah. had that in their resource. And if they do, if you're giving them like the biscuits or the banana, we always say, you know, that's okay. Just make sure you're wiping the gums or just uh, rinsing the after the sugars after. Um, yeah, frozen banana under supervision might be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the next one that we also get asked a lot is um, thumb sucking is a natural reflex. That is true. So that's something that a lot of um, kids will do, just a sucking on their thumb. Um, this is something that usually uh, stops by the age of two. Um, it's a way for babies to feel secure and happy, um, just like a comforting uh, habit. So if you're um, choosing to introduce a soother, uh, we always recommend the moms choose a one piece because it's less of a choking hazard for the baby. Um, you should also wait, um, you should also wait to introduce the, the soother until breastfeeding is firmly, uh, firmly established um, for those that are choosing to breastfeed. And uh, so some of the consequences of prolonged um, soother or thumb sucking. Uh, it can be that it can create crowded crooked teeth or even like open bite uh, problems later on in life. Um, we recommend that um, parents try to stop the thumb and um, so their habits by the age of three or four years of age at the latest. Um, there's, um, there's evidence saying that it's uh, thumb sucking or so their um, usage is unlikely to result in long-term dental effects if um, they stop before the age of five, but we want that to be like the latest age. Um, so we always recommend to start trying to stop that habit before then, so three or four years. And as always, um, we never recommend dipping like soothers on any sugary substances um, like honey or sugar water or anything like that, because that can also lead to caries. And this is just another of um, our resources that we developed maybe a year or two ago. Um, it's just also from suggestions from um, community people and um, some of our partners as well. So it's just giving some um, tips on how to break the habit and um, what it means when babies are um, like thumb sucking or using a soother, how, yeah, and um, what the consequences may be. 
Thanks, Melina. So um, Melina has mentioned she often gets asked as well about diet sodas, and then this was one that was suggested by one of our, our partners mm -hmm. um, with our Healthy Smile, Happy Child initiative about diet soda is okay for teeth because it has no sugar. So I think um, it's true, mm -hmm. but also um, somewhat of a myth because while it is sugar-free, so that's a good thing, um, we do need to remember, and sometimes something that only popped into my mind um, just a few weeks ago after doing some reading again, is that even a carbonation of uh, beverages can actually uh, change the pH a little bit oh. and make it a little bit more acidic. So we do just want to make sure a lot of these diet sodas are, even though that they're sugar-free, they tend to be high on the acidic side. Um, and that can then lead to um, tooth erosion, erosion of enamel. Um, and then that can also lead to sensitivity and if also uh, perhaps lead to, to caries as well if enamel is missing and dentin is exposed then to um, other sugars. So we do want people just to be aware of that. Um, just it's, it's a wiser choice, but still has a little bit of uh, risk associated with it. Oh, and I always say to um, if you do want to drink a soda, like a, a diet soda, just using a straw is mm -hmm. also better than just drinking it from the can or the bottle because it will go directly, won't touch your teeth as much. So we usually get asked to, to try to identify um, good snacks for children. And I think most in the dental community will know the benefits of cheese. And so cheese has anti-cavity properties and that we will say is factual. Um, there was a nice um, study that came out recently. Um, so Melina was able to, to review it as well, um, looking at um, dairy and dental health um, and basically saying that uh, dairy is important to maintain good overall health, um, including bone and dental health. Um, they tested several different dairy products in the study, looking at milk and sugar-free yogurt and cheese. And, and they concluded that cheese definitely helped to rapidly increase the pH level in the mouth. So made it into, a, an, and raising the pH is a good thing. You want a higher pH, because the lower pH means acidic. Um, and so the, the use of cheese um, is helpful uh, in our fight against uh, caries. And we also want to know uh, or let you know that also the stimulation of saliva by chewing cheese also helps um, to uh, reduce the risk by having saliva present. It helps to buffer against any acids in the environment, also helps to clear off um, debris from the teeth. And as well, saliva has enzymes in it that have antibacterial and antifungal and antiviral properties. So um, our built-in immune defense system with saliva. There's also some compounds in cheese that also um, interfere with the adherence of bacteria uh, to, to, um, to the enamel as well. And so this disruption of forming the dental plaque is also a very, very uh, good element of cheese. And so cheese is a good snack for kids and adults. So, Bob, there's some uh, questions about the soda uh, yeah. slide. Do you want to leave those for the end or? Um, I'm just looking at time. I guess we could handle one or two. Yeah, there's a couple. So does flavored soda water uh, carbonated mm -hmm. also pose a risk? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I think um, carbonation might add a little bit into the water. So there is some thought out there that that could make it a little bit more acidic. Um, but I know many of the flavors that are added on or added into, like say for instance, your soda stream um, are often, I think, sugar-free. Um, so I think, and as well, you know, if you're just using uh, plain water and adding lemon in, you're adding a little bit of acid in there, but it's not like your teeth are gonna be constantly exposed to that um, throughout the day. Um, but there, that's maybe something we'll have to do a little bit more digging on um, for an, another round of, of our fact and myth. Yeah, and just the um, another one is, are we not concerned also about the possible health effects of artificial artificial sweeteners yes, um, in the diet ones? Definitely yeah. too. Yeah. That's, that's another good point. Thank you so much. Sometimes yeah. we only think about the teeth and we don't also think that there might also be some uh, effects um, from all of these um, substitutes um, 
and artificial sweeteners in, into our diets. Okay, and then we'll, I guess we'll take the other questions uh, sure. later on. So we also get asked repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly about mm -hmm. the use of toothpaste. Um, and so fluoride toothpaste in the appropriate amounts is safe for, for children to use. And we are going to say that that is a fact. Um, one, of the, letting me. <laughs> one of the things that I find <laughs> repeatedly um, when I see young families and young kids that come in, um, so many times the parents have chosen, even if they have a limiting purchasing ability, they might be low income, um, they're purchasing expensive training toothpaste that are fluoride free. And when we do the examination on these children, we're already starting to see early signs of caries with white spot lesions and having that conversation because these fluoride uh, training, fluoride free products are often the ones that stand out more on the shelf. Parents think because they're more expensive, they're better. They're all in parenting magazines. And we just want parents to know as well that if in the appropriate amounts, a fluoridated toothpaste is very uh, good to introduce. And so here's a systematic review. Again, this is the same paper that we quoted before, um, the uh, Paula Moynihan's group. Uh, they looked at multiple risk factors for caries. And in this sort of um, forest plot uh, graph, they're able to look at their four studies that they reviewed to see um, does an optimum concentration of fluoride in water um, affect or reduce the risk of caries and it's basically showing that there is a favorable effect. So children exposed to fluoridated water appear to have less likelihood, lower odds of um, early childhood caries. Um, so think about fluoride. Um, we know that fluoride helps to strengthen our enamel. Um, so it, it adds and substitutes itself into the uh, hydroxyapatite to become fluorapatite to become very resistant to caries. So it's that protective uh, effect. Also, if um, individuals, adults and children maybe have early stages of early white spot lesions, um, or even before those are visibly cl visible clinically, uh, fluoride can help remineralize those areas. But I think one that's often forgotten by a lot of individuals, so I've tried to emphasize this with our dental and dental hygiene students, is uh, fluoride also inhibits a plaque bacteria and can slow down um, their um, ability to replicate. And so it in itself has wonderful antimicrobial properties. So we know we, we want fluoride to be our friend, but definitely we want it being a supervised um, use of fluoride um, for young children. Um, so again, a poster that was created by our students over the years because of many requests is about fluoridated tooth, uh, toothpaste. Um, one of the things from Nigel Pitts, who's a world-renowned expert on dental caries out of the UK, um, I think this is one thing that often maybe is forgotten in dental circles. So we often think newly erupted teeth are the most resistant to caries, um, but in fact, um, they're less resistant to caries when they first erupt into the mouth. So all the more reason to begin introducing fluoride toothpaste um, and getting that covered onto primary teeth that are newly erupted to begin to make them more resistant to caries. And again, my sort of caution, just, you know, beware of these training toothpaste because a lot of parents are fooled. They think more expensive is better. And so we parents had asked us, well, can you sort of start identifying for us which uh, uh, young toothpaste geared for young kids um, are um, containing fluoride and which ones we should look at. And again, if possible, try to see if you can find the Canadian Dental Association seal. Although many of the companies now are not necessarily all, you know, looking for endorsement from the CDA for their toothpaste. But we know for kids under three years of age, we definitely want to keep it to a grain of rice size amount of toothpaste. So this way, if they should ingest any toothpaste, swallow it it's at an amount that will not be toxic to them. Um, and then at uh, three to six years of age, um, children can begin to use a green pea size amount. Um, now, I tend to be of the mindset of a fluoridated toothpaste, a grain of rice size amount, beginning with the first tooth. Um, the Canadian Dental Association over the years has said it should be based on risk and definitely so. 
but if you look at many of the risk factors here that have been identified, living in an area where there's not a fluoride in the drinking water or people are choosing not to use tap water um, for their daily routines, then we definitely want children getting some fluoride exposure topically. Um, if children are already showing early signs of caries, of course we would want them to use fluoridated toothpaste. Um, if the sugary snacking and drinks are frequent between meals, that's another good indicator. And we know that uh, regular brushing is sometimes hard for families to achieve. So again, all the more reason to use a fluoridated child toothpaste and if the parent or family members have tooth decay. So I think, you know, this is one of the things that I think over the years there's been growing consensus now between CDA, Canadian Pediatric Society, Health Canada, now the Department of Indigenous Services, because for many years, fluoride toothpaste was not recommended um, under age three for a lot of Indigenous children. And that I think also contributed to many of them developing caries because I think the public health folks at first were really concerned about fluorosis, but um, I think there's a trade-off and if it's done uh, in a measured approach like this under parent supervision, uh, the risk for fluorosis is, is reduced as is any sort of harmful effects from fluoride. Over to you, Malia. Right, thank you. Yes. Um, so the next question is, I don't need to take my child to the dentist before the age of three. And yeah, and this is a plaque that I remember years ago. Yeah. I have it in my office still because it's old health promotion um, literature or a plaque from CDA many, many years ago. Yeah, so I put it there because just to show that this was the message that we were giving out um, to parents, but um, it has changed since then. Um, so now we're recommending that parents take their children to the dental office uh, when they get their first tooth or within six months when they get their first tooth or by their uh, first birthday. Um, we do not want children uh, or parents to, to wait until the age of three um, to take their children to a dentist or a dental hygienist, dental office, um, because by then usually there's already some sort of problem um, and the, the infant's risk of care should be assessed you know, before then, before there's a problem. And it should be discussed with the parents or the caregiver and given um, um, guidance as to how to uh, prevent caries from forming in the first place. Um, so as I said, the goal is to have children visit the dentist before there is a problem. And we want to establish a dental home. So it, a dental home would be like a place where the child will feel um, he can get used to going to the dental office from an early age and just get used to having people other than uh, his or her parents like poking around their mouths. So um, that's something that we want to start from an early age, just getting them used to going to a dental office and seeing other people. Thanks, Polina. So um, I know, I think in Manitoba and many other provinces, there's been great efforts with dental associations uh, pairing up and informing dental providers, dental offices of the need to have early visits. So I think maybe some provinces are further ahead than others. So this is a paper again out of that a pediatric family practice um, group in Toronto um, that they were looking as well of how many of the kids coming to their medical clinics were actually seeing dentists by um, early ages. And so in their data, so again, this was even amongst the more affluent group of um, children and families that less than 1% of the children were actually being seen by a year of age. Now granted, this is probably four years ago, but this has now sort of moved forward over time. So we're hoping that that's shifting. Um, and only about 2% were seen by two years of age. So it's one graph, the blue represents visits to the dentist and the red actually re uh, represents caries um, onset in kids or um, um, prevalence of caries. So we did actually um, find um, that factors associated with seeking dental care um, uh, older children, lower family income, definitely um, prolonged bottle use and um, increased intake of sweet drinks. These were factors that influenced whether parents were actually seeking out dental care for their children. So again, making sure that we can as much as possible work with our uh, medical colleagues, our, our, our public health colleagues to get good messaging out there. Um, for these early visits so we can begin to identify these risk factors and perform caries risk assessment 
on children. Um, so just wanted to talk about the NDA's free first visit program um, that was established. Uh, it was launched in 2010, so 10 years ago. Um, just it was the MDA reinforcing the message of taking your child to the dental office by their first birthday and having a lot of um, offices, um, dental offices here in Manitoba provide uh, a free first visit service. So it's just uh, like an assessment as well says, just making sure that everything's okay before the child needs any more expensive uh, treatment or, or uh, restorative treatment. So um, I always tell uh, parents when I go out and talk to them, we don't, uh, I don't think we have an updated list of all the offices that are offering the free first visit program. Um, but I always say, you know, you just, all you have to do is just call the office. Um, if you have a regular office that you go to, just call that office and ask about the program because uh, a lot of them are still offering um, that service. Um, so uh, there was, the program was marketed through uh, to the public through media and um, advertising um, through uh, on buses and, and that kind of stuff. I don't know if they're still doing that, but a lot of offices, as I said, still offer the program. So it's worth uh, telling if you have patients uh, wondering about it, just to give the office a call. And I think the campaign, Melina, we, we undertook some evaluation, a few uh, projects with the MBA in partnership and showed that there was an uh, increase in uptake and participation, including some qualitative research mm -hmm. with parents and with dental dentists um, in their offices who were seeing these kids. And I think the really good message is there is, I think now we've educated a large portion of the population uh, mm -hmm. about this. And I think it's to the point that even parents are now expecting uh, this and actually mm -hmm. seeking out. And if if, you, if dental offices are not willing, they're just gonna move on to the next. So I know for those thinking of marketing their offices, this is a great way to grow your practice too. I know I don't wanna mm -hmm. always put a business end to it, mm -hmm. but you know, many times parents test out how the dentist and the dental mm -hmm. team is with the children before they themselves book their own appointments. Yeah. So. I have a lot of parents who, when I do presentations, they will say to me that they try to take their child mm -hmm. um, to an office and the dentist or the dental hygienist, whoever, will say no because they're too young, there's nothing to see. I always tell them, just insist, tell them that you just want a quick checkup, even when, if you have an appointment, if the parent has an appointment, just bring the child and ask for a quick checkup, and they still say no. It's, you can always call another office that will right. offer the service. And I think this is maybe where as well, and I think more work for us to do too, is to also engage the dental receptionist because mm -hmm. they're the true gatekeepers in the office and they might not always <laughs> be telling the dentists and hygienists and assistants and other members of the dental team about yeah. the inquiries they're getting. So really make sure that you also, if you're adopting these policies, um, and preventive practices in your office to make sure your front office staff are in the know when they're answering a phone call and email. Mm -hmm. Great. So last segment is um, especially we want to focus on SDF because we get a lot of questions and I know it's very popular and I know oral science has been doing some presentations on SDF. We've done some too and some research. Um, so we figured, I think this is very helpful, especially now given the, the times we're in where uh, maybe traditional dental care is not going to be resuming rapidly. Uh, mm -hmm. There might be elements, but um, is there an ability to add SDF into your practice as a way to manage early childhood care? So the question we often get asked is, you know, is SDF appropriate for early childhood care? And we actually say yes. So um this is a myth to say that it's not appropriate for early childhood caries now granted i'm going to also now say that we have to be very careful about who can benefit and what case um, criteria you need so there could be individuals where certain teeth might be um, eligible and and appropriate to use sdf on and there might be um, teeth or, or cases where sdf may not be appropriate so don't uh, be very careful. Don't just sort of put it on every tooth. Um, be mindful. So we do have some guidelines that have been developed and have been shared out by the MDA before. I know Quebec, um, the hygienists there have taken this and have translated this into French and are sharing that with their, their members. This has been shared with the Public Health Agency of Canada. 
But groups who could um, benefit from SDF is people who have a high caries risk. So that includes young kids and have lots of active ca cavitated um, lesions. Um, and uh, as well, um, individuals where there's maybe behavioral or medical management challenges, um, people who have multiple caries lesions that can't be treated in, in one visit. So think about it maybe now, especially with COVID, you've dealt with a dental emergency um, but for a child, but you also see that there's other teeth where maybe SDF would be appropriate. Well, and you may not be able to see that child for ambulatory care for a while, maybe SDF's appropriate or if someone's coming for, from rural areas um, and don't have great access, you know, maybe you restore what you can and use SDF as a holding pattern on the other teeth. Um, and then again, teeth that are lesions that are maybe difficult to, to treat with um, invasive restorations, maybe you're medically compromised or your um, you're a patient with developmental um, disabilities. Um, I think these are really important. So I'm going to the next slide. Mm -hmm. But I think we want people to be very um, cautious um, with SDF. So criteria, um, SDF, you want to make sure that there's no clinical signs of palpable inflammation or no reports um, from the patient or the parent that, um, th that there's spontaneous or unsolicited pain. Because if parents are saying, you know, this tooth is... is starting to hurt my child when they're eating, when they're brushing or waking them at night, SDF is likely only going to make things worse. Uh, again, yes, we might not always have ability in young kids to take radiographs, but use your clinical judgment. If lesions, if you think that they're encroaching the pulp tissues again, um, I would say those are not appropriate. And so again, this is referenced from the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Um, take radiographs when you can. Um, and then again, we want to make sure people who get asked this a lot, well, I see lesions on radiographs in between teeth, but I don't know how to get in there. Um, so um, I think you want to make sure that you can actually get them accessible uh, or get access um, to these surfaces with a micro brush. I know people are dipping SDF into floss, super floss and flossing that through. I just don't know what the uptake is like. Um, so what, what is being recommended is actually um, placing orthodontic separators if the, if the person or the patient can tolerate, having them come back and then removing the separator and you've got a little bit of space for your micro brush and SDF to flow. Um, but SDF can be used as part of um, a, a, your overall uh, treatment, though, to manage caries. But just be very careful um, when you're selecting. So next slide, Melina. So this is a very good resource. Uh, it's, it's a great decision tree from the American Dental Association. They have done an excellent review back in 2018 that may, maybe not everybody is aware of. But they actually look at um, topical or non-restorative treatment options for dealing with caries in adults and children. And for primary teeth here, um, whether it's an in-between aproximal lesion, one on the occlusal surface or one on the facial lingual aspect, um, they are recommending different pathways. If we have a lesion that is broken through the tooth, so it's an actual cavity or cavitation lesion, SDF is what's recommended um, to non-restoratively manage that caries lesion. And then it differs if it's a non-cavitated or a white spot lesion. So again, SDF is not recommended um, for white spot lesions at this point in time because be mindful, um, maybe not so bad for a primary tooth um, because the silver will be absorbed. It's, it's not the most aesthetic. But if it's a permanent anterior tooth that has a white spot lesion and you paint SDF on it, that's integrated into the tooth and now you have a longer term cosmetic issue. Okay, so we have a study that's been accepted um, by the Journal of the Canadian Dental Association and hope that it's in press very soon. Uh, looking at this is work by our resident pediatric dentistry resident um, Rina Sira, uh, who's now in Calgary practicing as a pediatric dentist, where we looked at uh, two applications of SDF four months apart. Um, and so the red bars are, is the uh, 
percent of um, cavities treated but with SDF that are rested after uh, one application. And the, the pink is after two applications. So on average, one application of SDF works quite well, but it's still less than 75% of lesions are resting. Whereas after two applications of SDF, it, that increased to 96%. Now, we also find certain teeth arrest better than others, anterior teeth, especially upper anterior teeth, um, easier to arrest. We're finding lower molars, um, primary molars, sometimes a little bit harder because, um, and especially interproximal lesions where there's cavitation um, and it's a plaque trap, those are tougher areas um, to get arrest because there's constant sort of exposure to carbohydrates and plaque and bacteria. Uh, so Melina, next slide. This is just a photo. So again, be, be mindful and talk to parents. The best advice is to make sure we've got a consent form. If, you're happy, if you want it, let us know. Uh, we'll gladly share that with you. But again, I think getting um, consent from parents is really important um, and showing them uh, pictures before and after. Um, so that this way they can make an informed decision if this is an appropriate thing for their children. Melina? Um, yeah, the next topic is, um, so given everything that um, Bob has just shared, uh, especially about the aesthetic um, uh, part of it, um, the, uh, a lot of people think that parents are unwilling to accept SDF um, as an option to ma manage their child's uh, tooth decay. Um, we've done a few studies there. There have been done a um, few studies, and we see that this is also a myth, um, mostly. So um, here we have conducted actually two studies on um, two different studies on the parents' point of view of uh, about SDF. So one of the studies was a uh, focus groups with uh, First Nations and Métis parents. And um, these parents had not uh, had their children uh, undergo SDF treatment. And some of them hadn't even uh, heard about the, the treatment as an option. And then uh, the, second, um, the second study was with focus groups with newcomers from 10 different countries. And these parents uh, had children in, a, in another study and they had had um, SDF as part of this. Um, study. So for the first group, the First Nations and Métis um, focus groups, um, this is a question that we asked them. Um, if you knew that there was a liquid that could be painted on children's teeth that would turn their decay black, but would stop um, the need for a filling and possibly stop the need for a trip to the operating room, how would you feel about that? Um, or is that something that you would be uh, willing to try? So from the responses that we got, 66.1% uh, of parents um, said that they would consider F SDF um, overall over dental surgery under um, general anesthesia. So uh, parents said that they would be willing to try SDF as long as um, this treatment prevents infections and it also decreases the need for dental surgery. Dental surgery was a topic that a lot of parents express uh, fear about uh, because of the consequences and um, you know the effects that it can have on, on them and their children. Um, only 20% of the parents said that they would not be willing to try SDF at the moment because not because of the black teeth or anything like that, but only because they would like more research or they would like to be informed more about it. Uh, so these are just a couple of quotes that uh, we got. This is a study that was done, the qualitative part of the study was done by um, Dr. Uh, Grace Kiyonachan, who's somewhere in the office here. Um, so she's the one who uh, did the data analysis and conducted the focus groups uh, for us. So um, one of the quotes says, um, I do it just because then um, they don't want to go to the surgery. So again, going back to the fear of dental surgery. Um, so they would prefer to have SDF. Um, the other quote, the, the longest one, it's because it's gonna stop the decay immediately after uh, possibly one application. And if they have um, pain, the, the, they say that it's gonna stop the decay, the, their children are not gonna have that pain anymore. And also they're not gonna have to go on a waiting list and wait a long time if the children are in pain. 
Yeah, so this study, Melina, mm -hmm. um, the paper has now been accepted um, by the journal Public Health Dentistry and should hopefully be in press within the next month or so. So we can then share that. So it might be very informative for those of you working with um, Indigenous communities and you want to implement SDF, this might give you some factors to consider. Yeah, and a lot of the parents who weren't really um, uh, worried about the, the black staining, some of them were, but a lot of, a lot of them said, you know, the, the teeth are going to fall out anyway um, in a couple of years. So um, they would rather have uh, their children have black teeth than be in pain or having to wait for uh, surgery. Uh, so the other study was uh, with the newcomers who, uh, parents whose kids had had um, SDF. Um, 86, over 86% said that they were not worried about the treatment. Um, a lot of them, 88% said that they would recommend the treatment to others, um, to family or friends. And only 36% uh, percent expressed concern with the black staining, but they said that even though they didn't like the black staining, they would still prefer SDF over other more invasive uh, restorative treatments or extractions. And these are just some of the quotes from um, the newcomer parents. Um, again, uh, stopping pain was a big priority. Um, also, yeah, so most of them actually for, for this one was the pain factor was a big, big thing. Um, and then just not wanting those like very invasive procedures that would come with extensive um, ECC. Um, this was another study that was done. Um, this was uh, web-based, so uh, parents were taking like a, a survey online uh, about you know, their perceptions or point of view about SDF and whether um, they would accept it as a possible treatment um, for certain cases. So for this one, a lot of uh, parents also, um, uh, sorry, they, they will look at the pictures with the treatment as well as just to um, have something to base their opinions on. And then um, they also had information about SDF. So um, again, it was a, a high amount of parents said that um, SDF staining, mostly on posterior teeth was acceptable. Only 29% said that they would be acceptable in the anterior teeth, but um, Acceptance of SDF as a treatment also increased as the behavioral um, barriers, I guess, increased. So if children were uh, had some beha behavioral issues or were hard to manage uh, in a dental setting, um, then the acceptance of SDF as a treatment increased. Um, didn't really matter whether it were posterior or uh, anterior teeth at that point. Um, and again, most parents preferred SDF over other more invasive treatment especially um, surgery under general anesthesia. And that's part one. <laughs> yeah, so we've taken an hour. So yeah. <laughs> um, we, we have lots more. We had to trim it down because we realized we had too many slides for the one hour. So we're hoping that you'd be willing to join us for a part two in, in a few weeks. Um, where we can talk about uh, some more topics that routinely come up about caries risk assessment and oral hygiene. You know, does uh, do fillings change the oral microbiome? Um, is it safe to seek dental care during pregnancy? Um, so those are some questions. Um, but right now, Melina, if you want, we can maybe mm -hmm. take off a, a share screen and maybe see if there's a few questions. We've got yeah. maybe time for. Uh, uh, maybe five minutes worth of questions, if anybody yeah. has. I know we have lots of uh, comments in the chat. Okay. Um, just let me get this. Perfect. There we go. Let's just go back. I think there was, if you want to start with the first one, okay. uh, any recommendations for how to wipe your baby's mouth? My finger is almost bigger than her five-week-old mouth, and to <laughs> then put a cloth around it is very hard or impossible. So I think, you know, you could use a little bit of a face cloth um, if you wanted to do that or just carefully. Uh, sometimes there are those little finger sleeves that you could put over um, onto, your, onto your finger and, and do a little sleep through the mouth. Or even if you've got a, a thin fabric that you could do that to wipe, I think that's very helpful. Um, definitely, yeah, you don't want to be, you know, traumatizing your child if they have a tiny, tiny opening. Um, but I think the more that you get uh, children familiar with um, 
you working inside their mouths, they're going to be more acceptable uh, or accepting of you um, initiating oral hygiene um, activities. Melina, are there any products that you come across? Um, no, I usually yeah, just recommend the, the, the wipe or yeah, just the, the finger, mm -hmm. the little finger, yeah. I know many years ago there, there was a lot of um, hope. There was a product that had like a xylitol wipe that you could use to wipe your kid's mouth and that sort of fell by the wayside because no one's really necessarily going to buy a, a wipe, dis oral disinfecting <laughs> wipe for your young child, right? And we certainly don't want to do uh, talk about wipes and getting people conf confused about disinfecting wipes and whatever. Yeah. We don't want a Donald Trump <laughs> scenario um, going on with, you know, what to disinfect and what you can't disinfect. But I think just a, um, a soft cloth, if you have it, the mm -hmm. face cloth is too, um, is too thick, then maybe just, um, just a, a regular cloth that you have at home that's relatively thin and clean to, to moisten that and wipe through. Or even just like a sturdy paper towel too that you can like put some water on but as long as it's like very not yeah. not a lot that they can like swallow the I paper just, towel I, but yeah, like, I just don't want it breaking like, down and choking if it's just, yeah, yeah if it's just very quick like a quick yeah yeah um next question I think there was a lot of questions around the fever and teething if okay. they yes. could elaborate on that. Yeah, so we're taking our evidence from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So those are the physicians, the, the pediatricians. And so they looked at when they developed their resource, the evidence, and they didn't find a strong evidence sort of showing high fever is, is a typical um, symptom or sign of teething. Uh, but as Melina mentioned, sometimes there can be a mild temperature spike. Um, so I think now parents are probably everybody or a lot of people have bought infrared thermometers off of Amazon the last little while. So maybe some parents might be able to do their temperature checks, either ear checks or forehead checks on their little ones, sort of when they're not teething and when they're teething and sort of see and maybe um, provide more information. One of the, sort of a bit of humor there from me, sorry. One of the questions is if fever isn't common uh, with teething, mm -hmm. um, why is it that so many moms see like the mild increase in temperature? Yeah, I think the mild is, is what's often seen, but it's not, the mild temperature increase doesn't necessarily bring maybe the child to an actual fever threshold above like 38 Celsius, right? Mm -hmm. So it might be a minor increase in, in the child's temperature, but not to that fever range. Okay. That was the question. I see there one was a question carrots, about large carrots. There's, there's one about uh, the FDF study. Um, what Can was the time that? interval? between the two SDF applications? Yeah, so for our pilot study that we had done um, that's in press, um, that was four months between applications. I think the one thing that we definitely want people to know that if SDF is not once and done, it's one, two, and then maybe a few more. Um, so generally speaking, even after Carries has arrested, this is why if you're doing it in your office, don't assume that the kids can just go and never be followed up again. Um, clinical follow-up is very important because we wanna make sure, uh, because um, recommendations are now even saying that even arrested lesions with SDF, um, you might need to bring these children back every six months for reapplication to keep the lesions arrested. Our current uh, trial right now, our randomized trial that we have underway um, is actually testing um, three different um, approaches, um, both two applications, but we're testing one month apart, four months apart, and six months apart. Those are the three groups the kids are randomized to. Um, and just to sort of see, um, are there differences? So we're recruited over, I think, 32 um, children to date. Um, and we've got quite a few more to recruit, but um, we'll have more data hopefully next year from that study. And also looking at changes to the microbiome, is how is SDF changing the microbiome in the kids' mouths, yes or no? And, and if yes, to what degree? Okay. So there's a, a couple of questions about grinding teeth. Is grinding of the teeth seen during teething? I think um, we can maybe add a grinding teeth to our next topic because um, we, we do even get not even just teething, but I, without me speaking inappropriately here, um, I would just, we can prepare some slides for that for the next time because we do frequently get asked questions about uh, children grinding their teeth and that would be a good topic that we can um, 
get you some evidence-based information. There. I think an, another one you're going to address in, the, in part two is this question, is it recommended to have hygiene appointments in the first trimester? Is there any safety mm -hmm. concerns for the baby? Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's, oh yeah, that will be in the next, yeah. And I saw a, a comment, a uh, question, sorry. What's your position on pre eruptive effect of fluoride on developing teeth? Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. Oh, of course, <laughs> um, Dr. Taylor, uh, that, that's actually Mark, um, yeah, there we go. But um, so I'll have to take a look at that. Obviously, there probably are effects on fluoride exposure to um, teeth that are developing in utero, um, because we know teeth already begin to form and calcify at even six weeks of, of pregnancy. So um, there could even be some situations there where um, fluoride might be crossing over um, and um, having an effect, but we can look that one up as well, Dr. Taylor. Yeah. And then there's another one on SDF. Um, is SDF most ideal for primary teeth only, or would it be acceptable to apply to posterior teeth as well? Yeah, great question. So the um, SDF um, table or the, the chart from the American Dental Association that I showed, um, Melina, maybe, I don't know. Well, anyways, we can maybe, uh, there, there are also, uh, there's a decision tree for permanent teeth as well. So SDF is not only for, for primary teeth, um, it's not, a, not limited to children either, but it does have, have benefits and implications for adults as well. The only thing that I'm going to make, ask you maybe just to be careful of is right now, um, looking at what the American Dental Association has put forward. A lot of us think that maybe root caries are ideal lesions to treat with SDF, but it's actually not recommended by the ADA. The ADA has other recommendations for dealing with root caries lesions right now, where SDF is more like a secondary um, choice. Um, so I think look up at that um, 2018 article um, we'll send the presentation out so you can look, and I believe the first author is Rebecca Slayton, S-L-A-Y-T-O-N, and it's from their expert panel looking at that. So SDF, yes, can be used permanent teeth and in adults. And someone wanted to know what was the interval between the two SDF applications for Rena. Yeah, yeah, and I mentioned that's oh, the four, months, yeah. four months apart, yeah. yeah. So we followed the children for over nine, like for nine months from recruitment to to completion of the study. Okay. Yeah, so I think we could probably. So I wanna thank everybody. Um, Melina is just scrolling down, but uh, thank you Melina for getting us organized. Daniela too. Um, thank you for all of uh, the people joining in today. This is exciting. I think mm -hmm. people are craving sometimes a little bit more than just COVID uh, information. <laughs> we get lots of emails on a daily basis of COVID and this is maybe just something uh, a change of pace for us and to get information out there. I'll shout out to Elaine. I see Elaine's name there and others on the screen. So thanks so much. Um, Sabrina, you were waving. Did you have a question? No? Yeah. No, just saying hi. Thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. Um, so if there's no other, Daniela, any wrapping up? You have some housekeeping yeah. for everybody? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be sending out an email to everyone uh, with uh, just some questions in regards to feedback. So I would really appreciate the feedback. And if you have any questions about myths around oral health uh, that for us to address next time, uh, send those back to me as well. And thank you, Dr. Schroet and Melina for a great presentation. Uh, and we will be seeing everybody on the next, uh, next topic. Okay, thank you.